So welcome, everyone. So please find your seats. Uh, if you have a seat next to you, which is open, please wave. Let people know that you have an empty seat. Make new friends. Uh, and if you don't have any seats, you have like, some space on the sides. OK, so there's one seat in the first row. And there's another one here and here. So just move up and find seats. OK, uh, so my name is Thomas Zimmerman, and this is Antonino Sabetta. Uh, we are the co-chairs of the software engineering in practice track at ICSI. And we hope you had a fantastic conference so far with many great presentations. And today you are in for a very special treat. We're going to have a keynote on the future of software engineering, which is going to be presented by Crady Butch. And Antonino will now present Crady, uh, introduce Crady. Thank you. The room is filled up, not surprisingly. Um, this is an amazing talk we're going to have today. Um, Grady Booch, uh, IBM Fellow, uh, Chief Scientist of uh, the, um, IBM Research. I think he's best known for uh, being one of the fathers of UML, but also had hundreds of uh, uh, scientific papers, uh, author of uh, six books, um, IBM Fellow, ACM Fellow, IEEE Fellow, regular columns uh, in IEEE Software. I think uh, he got many awards, more than I can possibly mention now. So I would like to just give him the stage. Uh, please join me in welcoming with him with a applause. Wow. There are four seats up here. <laughs> Welcome. Software is the invisible thread, and hardware is the loom on which we weave the fabric of computing. Developing software is kind of like raising a child. Especially for young children and young code, you'll encounter bad smells. <laughs> when things go well, then there is much joy. But in both cases, for code and for children, you have to learn to let go. Developing software is like building a doghouse. Sometimes you just do it. If you fail, you do it again. At the worst case, you annoy your dog, but you can always get a new dog. <laughs> Building software is like managing a city. You have many occupants who live there, who thrive there, and making changes is challenging, but you have to keep updating things because there's a danger that those people become restless and riot or move on to other cities. Developing software is like producing a film. You'll come together in small groups, work frantically for a while, and if you're successful, you may have a sequel. If you're really successful, you'll have a franchise. Developing software is like making love. There are mechanics involved, but at the end, it's ultimately an art. It's true. I leave this as an exercise for the student. <laughs> Imagine for a moment that you are a cultural anthropologist. Here we are in Papua New Guinea. And as a cultural anthropologist, your job will be largely to go into the field and study the narratives, the myths, the stories, the symbols, the rituals that take place. Now, imagine you're a cultural anthropologist who has been plopped into the middle of Silicon Valley. In this case, we are in the offices of Tumblr. What kinds of things might you discern we would see probably meaning in the way that they're organized in this war room. There is a curious thing about some have multiple screens, some have one screen, but they're all you know, decorating their offices in interesting ways. You probably, as you walk through their day, you'd see them do strange things like you know, get together and stand up and talk about things and then go sit down again and go stare at their computers for a while. As a cultural anthropologist, one of the things I would really worry about is where do they hide the women? <laughs> yeah. Now we have here so-called digital natives, people who have grown up with not knowing the internet never existed. Um, I have a hard time with that term, being a digital native. My first email address was in 1979, back in the time where we actually had a little mimeograph book that listed every email address of every person in the world. I wish I had kept a copy of that. 
So the notion of digital native is, is kind of like, reminds me of the Europeans who think they were the first to a place, but <laughs> it's the case they were probably not the first nor the second and probably not even the third. What I'd like to take you on is a journey today to examine how software engineering has evolved, where it is today, and where it shall come. As Carl Sagan said, in order to understand the present, we must understand the past. So we're going to take first a journey on the past and a long way, along the way, study what has been and the forces that led us there. Here we have a, a picture of a, an alchemist. It was a curious time in, in science, if you can call it that, because it was attempting to move forward without having any underlying theory. And we've seen that in some of the early days of software engineering. But the good news now is that for us, we have practice and we have a theory, and the two have come together very well. We therefore distinguish methods, which are those principles and practices and tools that help us construct things, and then methodologies, which are the philosophies behind it. Today in this journey, I want to take you on a tour of those methods and those methodologies and see what we might learn. With the Tumblr offices, I laughingly talked about where the women were. Really, the first computers were women. That if we look back on our history, we must realize that the term computer, of course, was one who computes. And most of the people who computed back then were women. We have here a picture from 1890. These are the Harvard computers, as they were called. And their job was largely to look at uh, photographs from various telescopes and plot their paths. And you'll notice they're applying agile practices here, that <laughs> they're in a war room. They're sort of a stand-up, I guess, <laughs> a daily stand-up. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a process that was indeed very agile. The group, group would get together and just you know, do the right things and adjust their way along the way. As we begin to mechanize things in computing, then efforts became a bit more regimented. In the presence of computational power, recognizing this is the time where the machines were more expensive than the humans, we would begin to establish these kinds of pipelines. And so sequential processing would come into play. Feynman did this in the Manhattan Project. He managed teams of women, largely women, uh, doing this kind of thing, where each one would have a particular task, would pass on, pass on that information to the next. This became further formalized as we started moving into punch cards. In fact, there's a delightful book, I urge you to read it, by J. Presper Eckert about punch card techniques for calculation. And it's a delightful book that goes through all the various workflows. Eckert was the first person who recognized patterns in software development. And this is the book that documented them for, uh, for punch cards. But again, it was very regimented. I don't know where they hid the women in this case. And I don't know about you, but every day that I program, I wear a suit just like this. <laughs> so there was an alternative model to the world. And this we began to see in the work of Vannevar Bush. Here he is at his differential analyzer. And this represented an important change in computing. Because all of a sudden, we were focused first upon numeric computation, but numeric in a very different way. And so the, the battles between analog and digital computing were in the forefront. In fact, this was a time of tremendous innovation. We celebrate the innovation we have now. We must realize there were also lots of periods of tremendous profound innovation, and this was one of them. Uh, lots of different machine architectures and machines being built. Indeed, one of them was the Harvard Mark I. If you look closely, you'll see a very young uh, Grace Hopper off to the right-hand side. And I'm delighted to report that I still have the nanosecond that Grace gave me. If you don't know the story, uh, Grace Hopper would uh, try to convince her her uh, management as to the power of what they were doing. And so what she would do is take these lengths of, of telephone wire, about 11 and a quarter inches, and hand them off to people saying, this is the distance light travels within a nanosecond. Think about it for a moment with your iPhone. If you've got a, if you've got a relatively modern iPhone running about two, three gigahertz, that means you've got two or three operations in the time light travels. And thinking about it back in that time, time frame, it was just astonishing to realize computation could come that quickly. What was software development like back then? Well, there really was no software, because mostly you were making the machine bend to your will. 
And so it was a matter of you know, tweaking, reprogramming through plug boards what the machines could do. And in fact, many of these were special purpose kinds of things. I have a premise that much of what exists in modern computing was born out of warfare. It's a phrase I use. It says, computing is woven on the loom of sorrow. Uh, if you go to uh, our website, Computing the Human Experience, you'll see a lecture we have on that particular topic. This is Colossus. And notice again, we have the women who are primarily the operators of the mach this machine. Tremendous machine. Of course, it's the one that Turing developed the theory for, but Tommy Flowers, who's often undercredited, is the one who built this machine. Were it not for the engineer in the room, uh, this would have not have come to pass. And it was because of Colossus that uh, the war was probably shortened by two years. If you haven't had a chance to see it, go watch the imitation game. Uh, great acting, interesting plot, uh, terrible history, but, <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun to watch. It's sort of like, you know, Turing single-handedly did everything. He didn't. Bright guy, but he wasn't, he wasn't the whole story as a bigger story. What was software development like then? Well, again, the machine was the software. They were pretty much indistinguishable. And so the Colossus was, in effect, a single pur purpose processor. You jump forward to the ENIAC, and the world begins to change. Because now, again, the women were the programmers. There is a delightful documentary where five of the still living women, I think they're still all alive, uh, who actually programmed the ENIAC have reported on, on what they did. Absolutely fascinating. And basically, they truly were the first programmers. They were given a mission by, by their managers saying, go make this happen. And they would program these plug boards to make it so. So it was very much an effort, uh, an activity of trial and effort. So here's what we can conclude about this first generation of, of computing. It was largely all about the hardware. Indeed, the developer, the computer, the person was pretty much indistinguishable from a hardware engineer and a software engineer. We began to see the diversion, but the two were pretty close to one another. Things changed in the next generation when Johnny came along. Uh, here he is in standing in front of the Johnny Act, and it's interesting to consider the kinds of problems he was facing. They were programming nuclear simulations, weather simulations, and artificial life, and my gosh, we're still doing the same things. Old software problems never die. <laughs> they truly don't. But here we began to see a change because now all of a sudden software began to loom as something that was different and important and came unto, unto its own. So we're going to see this build over time here. But now all of a sudden on top of our hardware, we had truly identifiable software. In the 50s, machines such as the IBM 650, which were the workhorse, we saw a shift in the use cases because where it was before that the Cold War and World War II drew a lot of what was happening in computing, now all of a sudden big business drew what was happening a lot. And still, processing was largely numeric in nature, but it was beginning to shift to uh, symbolic in nature. So the nature of what I did as a developer began to change as well. Most of your operators were still women. Programming was done largely on the punch cards. And we saw the beginning of the programming priesthood. Now, what do you mean by that? It was largely that here I'd go sit off in a corner with my flow charts. I'd go program something. I'd take this deck of cards. Actually, I'd take the program and these little sheets. I'd give them over to a fleet of women who would punch them up. I'd pick up the cards. I would walk over to the computer room, I genuflect, hand it to the priest there, in effect, who would then go away for a while and do some magical things and come back and say, yea, verily, son, you have sin taxed. And <laughs> ooh, that was really bad, wasn't it? <laughs> and we'd come back, and he, or he would have me do some, uh, uh, some changes. But that was the programming priesthood, because we saw the separation of me as the programmer from the machine itself. Again, it was the time where the machines were far more expensive than the humans were. But what began to happen is that we realized a lot of the things I was doing over and over again could really be codified. And so we saw the beginnings of the operating systems, the beginnings of separation of concerns from our machines. I have a premise that the entire history of software engineering is one of rising levels of abstraction. And we see that here as we move from the abstraction of our machines to our software itself. The other thing that happened around this time frame is we started putting interesting devices along them. 
the devices that humans could use. And this was also about the time of Project Mac, where we realized these machines, which were very expensive, we needed to use in idle time, so let's introduce the idea of time sharing. Didn't, you know, it complicated the operating system. Indeed, there was a lot of vibrant work going on in that space. But for the end user, if you will, the end application developer, life hadn't changed that much. The other thing we did, of course, is start, started adding interesting devices to it, not just human devices. And then the world shifted with things such as this. This is project, the, the SAGE, the semi-automatic ground environment, which was perhaps the first really large software system that anybody had built. It was never used in anger. It was used in mistake. We saw the moon rising and thought the Russians were coming after us, and that was not a good thing. But it was a great example of using software-intensive systems as a political weapon. Uh, why did we make SAGE? We were worried about in the Cold War with the Russians coming over the, over the, uh, the, uh, the pole and attacking us. So we had this, the dew line, which was the set of radars. And then this device, which of course had as its predecessor, the whirlwind and all sorts of wonderful things, uh, which was the, the, the center of all that happening. So in this period of time, we must recognize that most of the hard software problems were really happening again on the defense side, the really, really large ones. Until such time, we saw IBM come along with things like the IBM 360, which also changed the world. And we still had the programming priesthood to a large degree, but what changed here was the business proposition for why the 360 existed. It was a recognition that investment in software was so great that we needed to have a further level of abstraction in our instruction sets that made it possible to preserve our investment in software. So the problems of software engineering began to shift. They were ones of reuse. We were worried about how do I take this code and not have to write it again and again. So that was a common, a common theme. The first open source really happened around this time, time frame. It was the SHARE organization, which was a non-IBM organization working with IBM kinds of products, which was a place where one could literally share libraries and code. So it was the first open source sharing of code itself. Now remember, much of this is still in assembly language, some degrees of higher order languages, COBOL and Fortran, of course. Um, this is also the time frame where we began to see the emergence of waterfall as a methodology. Why was that the case? Well, think about how things would break. We wanted to reduce the cost of software development. One way to do that is through reuse. Uh, it was also clear that the cost of change was very high. If you made a mistake, fixing it later was more expensive than fixing it earlier. So there was this economic push to push decidability and understandability up front. And so that's one of the motivations that, that pushed more of a waterfall life cycle. Also remember, too, that this is around the time of a great increase in production in our, in our, in our industries themselves. And so the practices that were happening in our factories, people found ways to find parallels in software development as well. So it was curious as we look back on it, but well-reasoned in the time it was. This was, again, the time when software grew and grew and grew until it really became a problem. And thus was born in 1968, the NATO conference, which coined the term software crisis, because it was clear to the industry at large, and remember this was a NATO conference, it was clear to the industry at large that we simply could not write software fast enough to do what we wanted to do. Now there's some controversy here as to the coining of the term software engineering. Because on the one hand, and I've checked both sources and I'm getting contradictory information, but if you talk to the people who went to the NATO conference, they said, yes, we named it such in the conference as a very you know, provocative term, but there's also indication that this woman is the first person who used it, Margaret Hamilton, a year or two before when she was at NASA. She's the person largely responsible for writing the software for the Apollo 11 guidance computer. And if you may remember when Armstrong was landing. Uh, there was a computer alarm that went off. It, the computer actually was getting too much data. It was in the wrong kind of mode. He properly shut it off. And if she had not programmed it such to fail safely, they probably would have aborted the mission. So her code, uh, which was a real focus upon safety and security and correctness, uh, is pretty much what saved that landing. It's interesting around this time frame because here you have some interesting folks. 
who were playing a role in software. You had Dijkstra, you had Hoar, and they coming from very mathematical backgrounds were intensely focused upon the provability of our software systems. But most of our software systems were still relatively large. It was reasonable and possible and desirable to prove their correctness, especially in circumstances such as this. So who first designed the term software engineering? I don't know. It's either Margaret or it's the folks at the NATO conference. That's a great project for one of you to go you know, investigate because we, I found data that supports both of those. No matter what, reality is that software development was a crisis. We simply didn't have enough software developers. We couldn't do it fast enough. Uh, and we were, we were experiencing lots and lots of errors. So this was also the time that Harlan Mills and his work in clean room development came to pass. And we saw the beginnings of the work of Jordan and Constantine and DeMarco with the ideas of the structured programming. And so the first methods slash methodologies came to be. Why did they come to pass? Well, think about the forces that were upon them at the time frame. Here we have languages that were largely algorithmic in nature. And as we dealt with increasing size, as Dijkstra and Hoare would tell us, the best way to deal with that complexity is by breaking it up into smaller problems. Thus, the notion of function or of algorithmic decomposition came to be. And that's a lot of what DeMarco and Gordon and Constantine were all about. Lots of methodologies, lots of notations that surrounded that. It was right for its time. It was still also very waterfallish because the risks of failure were very, very high. Well, what happened next is we began to see certainly increases in our machines in themselves. This is a time of wild innovation as well. We had the integrated circuit come on to, come on to play. We had so many variations of, of, of complex machines that were in play as well too. We then found that we started putting more interesting devices that humans could talk to on the outside. We were able to shrink the physical devices and this was the time of the mini computer. So what was happening in this time frame is that um, we began to see devices that were low enough cost, they could be put in places that were no longer just numeric or symbolic, but all of a sudden we were starting to build mirror worlds. This is what David Gallatner speaks of, and this is an important shift from numeric, which was purely mathematical, to symbolic, which certainly has some interesting theory associated with it, to all of a sudden now building software systems that were simulations of something and simulations at a very large degree. So the nature of what we were trying to build also fundamentally shifted. And this is around the time frame too where our earlier languages didn't quite fit. So we saw the beginnings of experimentations like Simula and Smalltalk, which were attempts to build simulation languages to support the creation of those, of those uh, mirror worlds. With the reduction in size of these devices, now we could start putting computing power into the devices themselves, into the, in, into the external devices, into the internal devices, and thus was born the personal computer. So it's interesting seeing the pendulum here because at first we had huge machines that many people serviced, and you would, if you read back the biographies of people back in that time frame, they loved the periods of time when they were the only ones in front of the machine because to them it was very, very personal indeed. I had an opportunity to interview uh, uh, Charles Simone, and the, who invented Word uh, and, and its predecessor. Um, and he talks of the time where when he was in Hungary, he basically had a huge mainframe all to his own. And it was, for him, personal computing back in the 60s. This brought it to the hands of everyone. And again, what changed in the software development problem was very fundamental as well. This is the time frame in which we had things like Visual Basic, which meant now all of a sudden, an individual could build small things that could be perused in some profound ways. More often than not, during this time frame and the decade afterwards, I would encounter projects who would tell me, yes, we built this visual basic prototype. My management loved it, and they said shipped it. And all of a sudden, we were sitting with this you know, multiple thousand line visual basic prototype that our business was relying upon. It was frightening to run across businesses like that. But it was not surprising because the demand for software was so insatiable, it meant we tried to build software much more quickly than we ever could in the past without the kind of discipline we saw in the previous time frames. There's a delightful book called What the Dormouse Said. 
which details this in, in some wonderful fashion, and makes the premise that a lot of what you see in the developing culture around this time frame came because of the counterculture in San Francisco, that the reaction against the programming priesthood, the reaction against the man, was driving a lot of what happened in this space as well. And of course, we can't neglect what happened at Xerox Park and all that that led to as well. This too changed the world. Because now all of a sudden my problem as a programmer was less so the core of things, but things on the outside with which the human began to interact. So here we have a time frame in which our systems, we could truly draw a line upon, around them, were very, very complex beasts indeed. And so the software crisis was no longer really crisis, but we had a crisis of innovation. There is so much we could do, we couldn't do enough quickly. We, we couldn't do it quickly enough. And of course, shortly thereafter, the problem changed because now all of a sudden we can network them. This is roughly in the network map of the first ARPANET connection. We can network those things, and we can network those things. And so the problem of software engineering shifted from just writing wonderful, beautiful lines of code to building systems, systems in a place where I no longer had control over those things with which I interacted. Uh, I think it's David Deutsch who said that a distributed system is one in which the failure of a component that you didn't even know exist can cause the failure of your system. That's a true distributed system, and we were very much in that. Of course, what then changed was the iPhone and all around it because now all of a sudden we had devices that became very personal. And so the shift began again. We moved from numeric to symbolic to mirror worlds to all of a sudden what some call the commercialization of the enterprise. It used to be the focus of development was either on the Cold War or on commerce, but now all of a sudden we had computational power in the, pan in the hands of a human. Now this upset a lot of businesses because they didn't anticipate this. They didn't see what the power of this mobile device could be. And that's part of the current crisis in which we're in right now. Now let's zoom back for a moment, back to, the, to, to this level of it. Because what was happening, what has been happening, is this. We've seen now with the networking that we have, and thank goodness for the new address, addressing scheme, we can now have an IP address for every atom on the face of the earth, so that's handy. Uh, I mean, consider, when the web was first conceived, who ever imagined your toilet seat would be IP addressable? <laughs> this was not one of the use cases. <laughs> and don't even get me started about teledildonics, but that's another world. If you don't know what I mean, Google it. <laughs> but this is the time frame where a lot of those devices became mobile. Many of those devices became personal. They were very connected to us. And that also changed the set of use cases. And they also became devices that fit into the world. So that led us to where we are in many ways today, on the cusp of today, or just a few years past, the formation of the Internet of Things, which we now have the potential to put devices literally everywhere. And that also shifts the problem of software development. In the last two to three years, I'd say the big shift has been here, as people have taken that framework and tried to move it to the cloud. So in practice, when I go work with, with organizations, a lot of what they're struggling with is just the mechanics of getting rid of their old data centers and putting into the cloud. And so, no surprise, the challenge that we're seeing in this space, in, in this space right now, uh, trying to figure out the rules about where can my data live and, and how do I you know, really optimize the number of machines I had, yada, yada. So this is a good and reasonable thing, and there are lots of people that are working in this space. This is also why you see the rise of DevOps because now all of a sudden you have not just the software problem, you have very much a systems problem. And so having a separation of concerns between your software and your hardware is not that great. You must really bring them together because otherwise you can't build the right kind of system for the right software that you need. We've seen, so especially in this case, the great work that, that's happened at Google and Facebook and Twitter, all those places for which there are high transactional systems. And that's a good thing. And so we have evolved over time patterns for building things into the cloud. But there's a curious thing that's happened that's a subtle shift I have seen. I spoke of it a few years ago as to the rise of domain-specific architectures, and we're very much seeing that. The shift now is to the rise of platforms. 
So where it used to be I was focused upon building a particular application for a PC or whatever, now all of a sudden the effects of dominant design come into play. Dominant design is a, a sort of a management theory that says that in a marketplace you'll eventually find there are those who have climbed the hill that others want to get around that hill because it has enabled third parties to do interesting things. And over time, you'll shed away those who are on the, the lower level, level hills and you'll end up with these dominant designs. It's why, you know, cars are the way the pedals and such are. It's why we have, you know, our keyboards the way they are, all a result of dominant design. The same thing is happening in software as well. So in this case, we have a number of platforms that have risen up. The Facebook platform and all the APIs around it, the Twitter platform. Uh, and it's also the case where you see lots of open source things come into play. Autosar as a platform, a hardware software architecture for building in-car electronics. And this is a good thing. So the curious shift we have therefore seen is it used to be the separation of concerns was over the operating system. And you remember the operating system wars. Is it, you know, is it Windows? Is it OS2? Is it whatever? People, you know, fought, definitely bought fights over that one. Today it's Android versus iOS. I don't care about that anymore because really the interesting thing is the platform that's a level above that. What constitutes those platforms? Largely it's a set of APIs. And so what we're seeing is the rise of other kinds of patterns, namely microservice architectures. So now we are in a stage where a lot of organizations are dealing with the componentization of those platforms. And here's an interesting story with Amazon that comes into play. Anybody from Amazon out there? I'm curious. Okay. You all have heard of Amazon, I'm sure. Okay. <laughs> here's a great example of a, uh, a great uh, unexpected consequence of an architectural decision. Some years ago, when Amazon was still relatively small, Jeff Bezos said to his engineers, everything shall be a service. They said, no way. Jeff being Jeff said, way. <laughs> and, and so with much wailing and gnashing of teeth, they began to componentize the code base of Amazon, which was roughly around that time a couple of million lines of code. So everything became a service, and this is in the early days of, of the creation of web services. Now, I take a very liberal view of what, what web services mean, because a web service is effectively saying, on the outside, I've got an API. It may be manifest in a heavyweight web service, using all the schlock that goes on in internet protocols. It may be much more lightweight. I don't care. That's an implementation detail, but it represents, for me, an inter interface of this thing. So Jeff said, everything shall be a service, and yea, verily, it came to pass it on the sixth day. They came out with a set of components inside Amazon, and somebody bright said, realized, oh, wait a minute, what would happen if we pull out our proprietary bits and take these components over here? Could we put them to a repurposing? And the answer is yes, that if we pull out all the parts that are Amazon-specific but leave all the other interesting services, a refactoring, if you will, we could make Amazon-branded stores. And thus was beginning the, the growth of what Amazon could be. Someone else, Bright, said, wait a minute, look here a little bit lower in these components, and you realize a lot of the stuff down at the bottom, which is just pure mechanics dealing with our networks, we have a lot of excess capacity. We don't use this stuff, you know, during the summer time frame or the spring, the really big times we have to build for our Christmas and Mother's Days and the like. What do we do with that? And some Bright person said, let's monetize it by selling it in a cloud. And thus was born from that architectural decision the repurposing and refactoring of their software base that made possible the Amazon Cloud, which is a dominant thing in this space. So here's an example of where an architectural decision leading to componentization can make a profound difference in the business itself. We're doing this in Watson today. So at IBM, you've heard of Watson Jeopardy, where we beat Jennings and all the others. It was roughly a code base of about 1.2 million lines of code, most of it Java, little bits of other kinds of languages here and there. But it was, as you might expect, a research project. And so we did lots of things to, you know, to make it work. But as we started moving it toward commercialization, we realized, hmm, there are some things here we can't give out to the world, but there are some things we can. So the last year and a half has really been one of refactoring it to do exactly this. And thus we have the IBM Next platform and the Watson ecosystem that provide a set of APIs that make it possible. Um, there's another thing that's happening in this space now, 
and that's that we are seeing some of the devices on this, this network become intensely personal to the point where the human now becomes the computer. And this also changes the nature of risk and changes the nature of the use cases in which we build. Fabulous video if you can take a look at this, but this is a, a, a vet who lost the use of both arms and he has this prosthetic that he can basically control with his mind. Pretty incredible. We're going to see more and more of that kind of thing. The other shift that's coming is many of these devices are becoming cognitive in nature. Uh, we have Siri, which is a great example of a thin client cognitive system. Siri, Cortana, uh, Google's equivalent of it are pretty much that. You have a little bit of processing here, but in effect, it's sending most of the stuff out to some exterior, uh, some central server. It munches upon it and sends it back. So we're replicating thin clients as we had back in the 70s and 80s. What's happening, take a look at what we're doing with Watson, what General Electric is doing. Now we're moving it to thick clients that take the case of General Electric, every one of their turbines, every one of their jet engines is an incredibly software intensive device. You may have heard of that tragic case of the plane that was, was lost, but the jet engines kept broadcasting for the longest time uh, up to GE because they send constant maintenance information. The problem is with the thin and thick clients is that all of a sudden if you do some computation here at the edge, you have to deal with the physics of data. Data has no weight, but it has mass, meaning Think about that for a minute, meaning that if I generate lots and lots of data over here, then the cost of me getting it to the data center is often too high. So the shift we're beginning to see is moving cognition to the edge. Within a human lifetime, you will generate probably about a petabyte of data, especially now if I think of a Google Watch. Anybody have a Google Watch? I'm curious. I haven't seen one yet. Woohoo! <laughs> All right. Do you like it? Yeah. All right. So you need to get a bodyguard when you leave so nobody <laughs> takes it off of you. Do you work for Apple? Do you work for Apple? No. Okay, that's okay. Just curious. <laughs> this is cool. My first Apple, my, my life is now complete. <laughs> Can I shake your hand later? <laughs> I promise not to steal your watch. <laughs> anyway, if you look at devices coming like that, then all of a sudden computing becomes very, very intimate. So here we have a case where at the very beginning of the story, humans were the computers, and now we're seeing the human become the computer. We're also seeing the move toward the computer becoming the human. There are three humans in this picture and three androids. Which are the androids? The androids are the ones that are sitting, by the way. Um, I have an interesting premise as to why this is happening more so in Japan than anywhere else in the world. Japan, in fact, let me step back. For me to understand how software engineering is changing, I have to look beyond our field, and I have to look at the social and economic and emotional things that are happening in the world. Here's one of them. In Japan, you have a country that is shrinking in population. The birth rate is not up to the replacement rate. You have a demographic that's incredibly skewed to the elderly, such the point you don't have enough young people who can care for the elderly. And lastly, you have very limited space. So therefore, it's reasonable to design pets that don't poop. It's reasonable, <laughs> think about it, thus the Abio was, was quite popular. It's reasonable to consider the creation of humanoid robotic assistants, especially for elder care, because we don't have enough humans to deal with it. Software development moves in very economic forces. It moves to those places where there is a demand pull and a technology push. Alan Newell has observed some years ago, the famous AI developer, computer technology offers the possibility of incorporating intelligent behavior in all the nooks and crannies of our world. With it, we can build an enchanted world. He said this back in the 50s and 60s, I think. We have built that enchanted world. We are there today. And get ready for it, you are the ones who are building it. That's pretty freaking cool if you think about it. It truly is. I will go on to say that computing has played a fundamental role in, in, the, in every aspect of the human experience. Uh, just to put in a little plug here, the last several years, my wife, here's my wife, right here in front, also my bodyguard, so you can borrow her later if need be when you head out. 
uh, the last several years, my wife and I have been working in conjunction with John Holler at the Computer History Museum to uh, do a documentary on computing. We call it Computing the Human Experience. Uh, much like Carl Sagan with Cosmos uh, was studying the interplay of science and humanity, we're trying to do the same kind of thing. And this is very much our premise. The story of computing is a story of humanity, and we are both co-evolving. Mary Shaw here is on our board of advisors. So thank you, Mary, for joining us. The fascinating thing for me is we recognize you know, this is, this is the truth about how computing has changed everything, but really, We've just begun. And so I want to turn the next part of this talk to consider what does that mean for us as software engineers? We've seen this journey of how we've gotten to where we are. Where are we going next? And we'll look at it by looking at the forces upon us. And I'm going to offer you some challenges as software engineers as to what I think the world needs to help us deal with what's next. Hardware is the stuff when it doesn't work that you kick. Software is the stuff when it doesn't work, you yell at. So, so to put it another way, software is the stuff that gives us life to our software intensive systems. And this is why the first principles we must return to. We are building software intensive systems. We don't build just software. We don't just build hardware. We are building things that are computational in nature and therefore we have to consider it from a systems perspective. What do we know about some of the underlying engineering principles that make sense? And notice I am calling it an engineering problem and I'll expand upon that in a moment. Well, first off, we know that uh, having good abstractions is a good thing. As I alluded to, the entire history of software engineering is largely one of increasing levels of abstraction. We've seen that in our languages, in our tools, in our hardware. We see it even in our methodologies. It's also the case that we need to have, as another key principle, a good separation of concerns. You saw this in the example with Amazon, that insofar as I can have reasonably loosely coupled components then it's possible for me to build things and repurpose them in interesting ways. This is the idea that Herbert Simon describes in Sciences of the Artificial, great book in which he describes how complexity manifests itself in different systems. We see it in organic systems, in human systems, in software systems, and one of those ways is by having that separation of concerns together with what he calls punctuated equilibrium. In agile development, we would call it continuous release. So in other words, ha and there's, so in other words there's, a, there's really a, a good theoretical foundation to what happens in Agile stuff. That by having these intermediate steps of stable points, it's possible for us to step back and regroup and then move forward and reassess where we are. Um, the other, the third, let's see, two principles, abstraction, separation of concerns, uh, information hiding, of course, and the last one is that of simplicity. Simplicity is probably the hardest. When I was working with eBay a few years ago, uh, they, did, they told me they did something marvelous, that they spent about 10% of their development budget on refactoring. And I think that's a great thing because it represents here you've got an organization that recognizes that code is never perfect, it never will be perfect, but you must invest energy to make things simpler. All software also has a life cycle. This is actually a painting in the Afuzi uh, that's the ages of man. And it represents for me the same thing that is true with software, that all software goes through these kinds of ages. Um, one of the reasons that organizations such as Facebook and even Cisco and Twitter and such grew so rapidly is because they had no legacy. They could, with the vigor of youth, proceed to innovate in this rich primordial soup of stuff that was out there and put together some interesting things. That was great. Facebook now has a legacy problem. And Kent Beck, one of my dear friends and colleagues, works at Facebook these days. Follow what he says carefully in his Twitter feeds and Facebook posts. And you'll notice that he, he spends a lot of time mentoring the folks at Facebook in terms of nudging their code to be more interesting and usable. I had a chance to work at Facebook in the days when Facebook developers could all fit in a room about a quarter this size. It was fascinating. It was a great place. Uh, I wished I was a 20-something because I, I'd have lots of friends, I had lots of free food, and I'd never have to go home. They, that was sort of everything I could do there. I could even bring my dog, as many of them did. 
but I knew, and I, I mentioned this to the engineering manager at the time, not, not Zuck, but he had a, a lieutenant below him. I said, hmm, you just bought this company on the East Coast. Are you prepared for the social changes that are going to come to play when you develop, when you split your development organization? And he said, oh, won't be a problem. Well, we know it was. In fact, you can see that in the shift of the development methodologies that Zuck had. The earliest development methodologies he spoke of were break things early and quickly and do it often. Well, that pisses off a lot of people because if you have a large code base of, oh, a billion, and you start making changes that are surprising, then you do piss off a lot of people. So if you look at their current methodologies, their current mantra, he's changed it subtle, subtly, which says, you know, fail often, but, you know, have these stable intermediate forms as well, too. Be stable, do it in stable ways. So they've begun to understand the importance of intermediate forms. They've begun to understand the importance of software engineering. It's more than just putting some people in a room and, and hacking things together. Don't get me wrong. I am very, you know, I very much respect what the folks at Facebook have done, but it's interesting to see how they evolved over time, and they do have a legacy problem. Speaking of legacy, let's look at the IRS, the United States. Um, what is the language primarily used for the core tax system in the United States? Any, make a guess. Assembly, Assembly. yes, this man is right. <laughs> I kid you not that the core tax system in our IRS is IBM 360 assembly language. Did you write some of it? No, I told you. Okay. <laughs> Would you like a job there? <laughs> this is frightening but they have attempted several times to, to take that code and rewrite it. But here's a case where you've got an airplane that's flying, so to speak, and you've got to change out the airplane and the wing configuration and the engines while it's going on. Because the last thing you want to do is to screw up the inflow of money into the government because all sorts of things will fall apart. This is one of these where you can't fail. They've tried three or four times, and that's why assembly language still lives. There's a lesson here which goes beyond what this painting says, old code never dies. You have to kill it. <laughs> <laughs> My dear friend, Brand Selleck, um, wrote this on the back of a napkin once, and he took the ages of software to observe that over the life cycle of software, there is a period of, of a discovery, there is a period of invention, and a period of implementation. The reason that strict waterfall doesn't work is it doesn't reflect this. The reason that agile at the extreme doesn't work is that it breaks things too quickly. So you have to find the right balance. And every development organization, every culture, every history, every domain means you've got to adapt that methodology to that space. One of the questions I'll go into when I, I do a, a triage into a software project is to ask first, what is your rhythm of releases? And if they give me an answer like, oh, you know, we really don't do that, then I'll either run away screaming, as I have in some cases, uh, or I'll say, let me take your hand and let's patiently put in together a build and a release system because anything else I tell you would be useless. You're bleeding on the floor and you don't need vitamins, so let's, <laughs> let's deal with the blood first. And that's the first step. Let's stabilize the patient, and that's the first piece of it. Once I've done that, then I could begin talking about things like refactoring and modeling and all this. This is going to sound strange coming from a person who helped invent the UML, but the UML is irrelevant. The most important thing is a raw, running, naked code. Everything else is secondary or tertiary. That's not to say they aren't important, because it's those kinds of things, the modelings, the abstractions, the tests, that help us build the right things at the right time with the right set of resources. And that's why I say that software engineering is ultimately an engineering process that involves the resolution of static and dynamic forces upon a system. That's how I look at it as an engineering problem. So here I've got, for a typical software project, what are the forces upon me? By the way, I think we'll make these slides available, so you can take pictures. That's fine. I'll even, I'll even pose by them. So I had a Vanna White moment. Uh, 
But I've listed here the major forces upon any kind of system I encounter. At the top, we have the business ones, which in which we're often given capricious and arbitrary kinds of budgets in which you have to do things. This is the case where as a software engineer, sometimes you've got to speak truth to power, saying that is profoundly stupid, don't do that. Sometimes you'll win, sometimes you won't. But ultimately, as a software engineer, I'll tell you a secret to my survival. You have to train your management. You really, really have to do have to do so. And in fact, I have a great manager. Brent Halpern was my manager for the longest time. Perry, are you in the crowd, Perry Tarr? Are you here someplace? I think she was going to be here. Anyway, she, she works with Brent as well, too. He's a great manager because he and I have this, have this deal. He has the illusion of managing me, and, <laughs> and, and I accept the illusion that I can be managed. So it's a great deal. <laughs> Going around in uh, counterclockwise order, we have things that deal with the context. I have to deal with standards. I have to deal with compatibility. And this is where legacy comes into play. There are times you encounter where you simply can't start all over. In fact, I ran across this at Microsoft. I had an opportunity to sit down with the people who, who wrote Microsoft Word in the final versions. And um, they told me of an effort, um, I think it was around Windows 3.1, in which they realized Windows was winning in the marketplace, so they then said, let's step back and rewrite Word, because it really is terrible code. And so they started the project, and they discovered something very interesting. There were some subtle things in the code that were actually bugs. They were wrong. They fixed one in one case, and all of a sudden, this customer came screaming, saying, it used to be that these 50,000 documents all fit on one page, and now they fit on one page and one line. You have to fix that. So literally, there was a, a, an error in the code, but it was something the user was relying upon. So number one, they realized they could never recognize what all those subtle things were that people have adapted to Word. The second thing they realized is they couldn't write it fast enough because Word kept plodding along. And as they were trying to catch up with it, the target kept moving. So they eventually abandoned it. There is code within Word today that, much like the IRS, comes back from Simone's time. And that's true for pretty much everything you're going to write, unless it's truly disposable, like, you know, I don't know, Candy Crush or something like that. But even then, even then, the Candy Crush folks, they have a sequel. And so I'm sure they have the same kind of problem. Next level, we have the problems of development itself. This is the problems of managing software development. How do I organize my teams? We'll talk about that in a moment. We have then all the illities of the project itself. These are the things that constrain me. So as a software engineer, I must think about how do I resolve those forces. And they're not static forces, but they're dynamic forces. They change. And it's even more insidious, because the very presence of a system changes the environment. So it's not a zero-sum game. I have this other mental model I'd like to pass on to you that says, as I look at a vision for something like to build, and I want to turn this into raw writing naked code, there are things that stop me from doing so. So this is the beginnings of where I'd like to push you on to say, here as a software practitioner, these are the things that stop me from taking my vision and making it manifest. So these are the, these are the bottlenecks, and we're going to expand upon these. First off, there's this nasty thing called the laws of physics. Please bend them for me. <laughs> uh, literally, I ran across this one military project where they wanted to do this certain thing that had to do with synchronization across the globe. And I said, it's physically impossible. You cannot transmit information faster than the speed of light. And they said, but isn't it just a software problem? <laughs> Not in this universe. But this is the domain of Turing, of Shannon, of Boole. And so my urging to you is, who is the next Turing or Shannon or Boole in this audience to whom I'm speaking? Who is going to move us forward in that theory? And I'm speaking of information theory. I'm speaking of quantum computing theory, which is an interesting thing unto itself. We have ways to go. But as Feynman would also say, there's plenty of room down on the bottom. Even if I don't have limitations, on the physical side, I do have limitations on the algorithmic side. This is the domain of the Dijkstra's and the horrors of the world. This is the domain in which uh, formal proofs become very important because the key to many applications is that 
I know what I want to do, but I don't have a meaningful algorithm to get there. The Viterbi algorithm, essential to all cellular communication. The Blinn algorithm for shading, essential to all special effects. There are any number of such things you can point to. And so ask yourself, in your domain, are there opportunities for getting the nugget of that algorithm that prevent me or allow me to move forward? This is a barrier in some cases. Not all cases, but even beyond that, to continue Feynman's notion, plenty of room for us to still do interesting things. Now we move to the, oh, I should also add, this is the realm of the Knuths of the world, where we see the, in a way, it's not really a pattern language, but what Knuth has done is to effectively codify many interesting lower-level algorithms. As we move up to the next level, this is the world of Dick Gabriel and Mary Shaw and Philippe Krushton, in which we're now dealing with the kinds of patterns to architect our systems. It's no longer just the algorithms, but it's the ways I put those things together. Had a chance to work with the folks who invented, who wrote the code for, for uh, Photoshop. Let's play a guessing game. How many lines in the production version of Photoshop? Make a guess. 40 million. 50 million. 50 million is too high. Uh, you can apply the binary search to figure out. 45. Actually, 40 was too high as well. So I. 25, the 25 million thing, that's a little too high. It's somewhere around 15 to 20 million in the basic code base. But if you look at it, there are about 30 classes that really define the essence of Photoshop. The real interesting bits of Photoshop can be shown on a few pages. It's amazing. And all the other GORP around it deals with file protocols and user interface kinds of things, but the real essence of it is relatively small. This is the architecture and design problem. How do I take those wonderful algorithms and actually make them useful? So Dick Gabriel and others with the Hillside Group, this is where we've codified patterns. This is where Mary and her colleagues have codified architectural patterns. This is where Philippe Krushton has begun to, to really capture the ideas of common patterns for how I build these kinds of things. In fact, that leads us to the human problems. Um, many kinds of, many cases, and I see the crash and burn all the time in the Bay Area, you find some wonderful, well-intentioned people, you throw them lots and lots of piles of money, it's a great niche, but they just go crash and burn. Why is it? It's because they fail to deal with the organizational issues. And here's my, my urging to you. Software engineering is not just about the technology. It's also about the engineering of the humans involved. In fact, I would dare say that when I go in and triage a project, there are circumstances that I will show up as an uber geek. There are other days I will show up as Dr. Phil, if you know the reference. And I'll, and I'll knock some heads saying, you idiots. <laughs> or something kinder than that, because it has nothing to do with technical issues and has everything to do with social issues. So one of the things I think we lack in software engineering, we have great theoretical foundations for the engineering parts of it, the technical parts. We don't have so much on the human parts. And because it being very much a human problem, I think we can really move ourselves along that way. Next level is that of economics. This one's a little frightening as well, too. I, you know, I have great respect for Dave Parnas. You may remember in the time frame of the Software Development Initiative, Reagan's Star Wars, he stood up to the government and said, you can't do this. We want to build this Star Wars system, but it will never work. And sometimes you have to do that. So one of my urgings to you, in fact, it was the reason I asked the question to Susan yesterday. What can we as software engineers do to make a difference in the world? We're geeks. That's fine, but sometimes we have to go outside of our comfort zone and talk to the people who are the managers, who are the politicians, and tell them, you can't do this, or you should do this. We have a responsibility to do so. It's also the case that there are some things we may wish to do that we simply can't afford to do. And lastly, there are the human issues. This is the harder one. This is the domain of, of Sherry Turkle and Larry Lessig and, and, uh, and Nick Bostrom who are dealing with the human implications of what we do. I'm going to make a statement that you may or may not agree with, but I believe it profoundly. Every line of code you write has a moral and ethical implication. It may not look like it, but you are doing things that go far beyond the immediate consequences of what you do. We are the ones who are changing civilization line by line, and so the human issues begin to dominate.
Let's talk about those people issues for a bit more, because if you go back in time, you realize, think about the women computers in the 1890s. We had small groups of people we would throw together and do interesting things. That's cool. We began to separate the hardware and software folks. That's great. As software became more and more of a problem, our groups became larger, the programming priesthood came to be. And then with the internet, the economics of things changed that we could begin to outsource stuff. And this changed everything, not necessarily for the good. It was a time frame, which we're still in, in which software development has been viewed as a commodity. And parts of it are a commodity. But you can't outsource innovation. And I have seen organizations who, with great zeal, have broken apart their teams to the lowest cost developer in various parts of the world. And they failed miserably, and they can't understand why. And it's because their financial folks didn't understand the implications of it. So we've seen further divisions of teams, further teams. This is where we are today. Most interesting software development deals with the problems of teams of teams. And so therein lies the conundrum with agile methods, that it's easy for me to apply agile methods in the small teams, but the question is, how do I apply agile mechanisms at the large when I'm dealing with teams of teams? Here's a path to get there, and let me give you a conceptual model. Three axes. On one axis, we're going to plot, we're, we're going to plot methodologies and methods in the midst of this. On one axis, we have formality. So close to zero, there's informality. I throw people in a room. It's a doghouse algorithm. The Nike approach, just do it. At the other extreme, it's I'm building you know, something that your life depends upon. All right, in fact, here's a story that I just come to think of. A few years ago, uh, I had elective open heart surgery. Seriously, my nephew died of an aneurysm. In fact, every male in my family died of an aneurysm. And thanks to my wife, she took me kicking and screaming into the doctors and said, get an MRI. And I remember going to the Mayo Clinic and lying there, and I said, hmm, this MRI machine looks familiar. I looked at the logo, uh, the, the, the logo. hmm, it's, it's, that sounds really familiar. It's, it's GE. Oh my God, I know the people who wrote the software for this. <laughs> <clears throat> But they used the UML, so I was happy. So <laughs> I was very happy they used formal methods. <laughs> uh, so that's one level of formality. The next is that of risk. Um, how do I measure risk? There are some things that are low risk. If it fails, not a big deal. If you screw something up on a Google search, you know, not a big deal. You, you know, you have billions of more. But on the other hand, if I have something that's like an insulin pump and it skips a beat, then somebody's going to die. That's different levels of risk. So be careful when you're talking about applying agile methods. It doesn't necessarily fit all places, but it does have to fit that profile. And the last is that of scale, that I'm going to apply something different depending upon, you know, where I am and the size of things. Um, I, the last month, I have been on a bit of a mission to talk to projects who have been applying, in theory, Agile at scale. And I have to tell you that my investigation is not done, but I haven't found anybody who's really done it truly at huge scale. I find lots of small projects that are teams of teams, but not huge projects. So if you've got one that you can claim that from nothing to where you are now is completely Agile, please talk to me because I have not found such evidence. I have found the scaling up of Agile in interesting ways. It begins to apply more waterfallish things on top of the Agile so it becomes more of a mixture. So let me begin to offer you some challenges and I want to leave some time for some questions here. Here's what is the launching project point for me in all of this. We have an interesting role of us versus physicists. Physicists, astrophysicists in particular, look at the cosmos and they step back in awe at its beauty and its complexity. And they try to reduce it to the simplest possible rules, the standard model. And all of our science is directed toward understanding that in many ways. In computing, we have a different premise. Our premise is that the world is computable. And therefore, we start from the simplest things. Turing's universal computation, and we build complexity upon complexity upon complexity. I am of the mind that the mind itself is computable. Now, I'm also a very spiritual guy, so we can talk about that conundrum later, but I also therefore believe that sentience, or the illusion thereof, is a computational problem. So for me, the possibilities are quite boundless. Let me now talk about some of the challenges and a call to action for you as software engineers to make this manifest. We're going to start with languages. 
and I'm going to be a little controversial and ask the question, do we really need a new language? Do we really need new languages? I've lived through the time frame of ADA. ADA was an interesting exercise. It was the time of the software crisis, and the Department of Defense reasonably said, look, we have dozens upon dozens of languages we're using. Let's take the best that we know in software engineering. This is the ideas of Liskov's abstract data types and all those kinds of things, a real mathematical foundation, and let's make a language. Of course, you must remember the predecessors to ADA. We had Algol, we had Pascal, we had Smalltalk, we had Simula. So there's a lot of influences into it. If you look at contemporary languages, the reality is that there are a handful of languages that are really dominant. And I think research in languages is wonderful. We do see some outliers that come into play, languages like Swift. Why did Apple's language come into play? It's because they've got a huge installed base and a problem they need to solve therein. So the problems of languages, I would, I would chide you to say, is not so much a technical one. It's interesting, it's fascinating, it's very fun to get into. But pragmatically, introducing a new language is really, really hard because you have to deal with not just with the technology, you have to deal with the training, the teaching, the best practices, and the libraries. In fact, I would claim that the shift these days is it's less interesting for a new language for me and more interesting to the new libraries for me, just as we saw the shift with operating systems. Now, that being said, there is one case where I think new languages can play a role. And that's a reality that we see a tremendous rise in the number of non-programmers. There was an interesting demographic study done on uh, source Stack Overflow in which they did a study of who the people were that used Stack Overflow. And they came to realize that a large percentage of them did not have computer science degrees. They had no training whatsoever in software engineering. You talk to many scientists, those in computational physics, computational biology, computational psychology, you name it, they don't have computer science backgrounds. And so a lot of the software being built in the world these days is going to be built by people other than you and other than the people you have trained. So the interesting question is, can we, as software engineers, provide languages that allow more non-programmers to do things in a safe way? Please don't replicate the Visual Basic experience. Now, that did do good things, but it's an interesting challenge for you to consider. What does a non-programmer need to know? I'd add to this the interesting work going on at code.org that and the UK is doing a similar thing. We're effectively training everybody from K to 12 in some degree of coding. I think that's a reasonably good thing, although as I've chided both organizations, it's not the vocation of coding that's important, it's computational thinking that is important. So the question I would ask to you is, are there things you can do as a software engineer to help teach the essence of computational thinking to the masses who will come beyond us? We stand at the end of a very long lever and we stand on it, we move the world, but there are others coming onto that lever, and we have, we have a responsibility to help them. Let's look at the tooling perspective. And I'll ask the provocative question, do we really need an IDE? If you go into many of the startups in the valley and look around, like Tumblr and the like, you'll find some religious fanatics who use Eclipse and Visual Studio, but you would be very surprised to realize how many of them use just a plain old editor and command line stuff. It's all over the place. So you're seeing this curious reaction of we build these wonderful IDEs, you build it and nobody comes. So the question for you is, do we need an IDE? And do we need the next best thing? So I'd urge you to go in and, and study, do some demographic studies of what developers actually do. What happens in the day of a life of a developer? How do they spend their times? And there's a key word I'm gonna use here, and that's one of friction. Uh, there's only so much you can do to improve the productivity of an individual developer because ultimately it's a mental kind of thing. But there is a lot you can do as a software engineer to reduce their friction. What are the simple things you can do in tooling to make it easier to do the certain tasks? What are the things you can do so that they have fewer meetings so they can go off and build real things? So the question I have for you is what can you do to improve the productivity of the individual developer? But then... More importantly, what can you do to assist the work of teams? I don't see a lot of interesting research in this space. And this is where I think some cross-cross
across uh, field studies could be very, very useful. Sit down with some of the sociologists in your universities or, or HR people in your companies and really study what people do and then try to optimize them because this is the human side of the problem. I alluded to software development being a problem of cities. For me, building greenfield code is great, but my world, I deal with brownfield that I step into an organization and everybody has some degree of legacy, every one of them. It's fun going into a startup that has nothing because you know it's like kids in a candy shop, but very quickly they begin to realize there's a world out there they have to deal with and legacy again, again that tends to them. So my question for you is this, what are some of the best practices for agility at scale? This is what all the methodologists in my space are dealing with. I don't think we have all the answers here. We have certainly haven't codified them. There's much work to be done. And in particular, what are the best practices for agility at scale in the presence of legacy? What are the things that we need to do to help us understand our software? And thus, I believe, is born a new job title, which I've encountered three people who have this on their business cards. It's the title of software archaeologist. <laughs> Kid you not. Um, at the Computer History Museum, one of the things I've helped the group do is to capture classic code. We have all this wonderful hardware. It would be very sad if your children's children did not have the source code to Candy Crush. I think it'd be crushing, <laughs> or whatever it is. Today, we have the source code to, for Word, for DOS, for Photoshop, a number of things like that. I'd love to get the original source code to OS 360. We found later versions, but not the very first one. So if you've got things like that in your attic, please let me know, seriously, because we'd like to capture that kind of interesting code for future kinds of studies. What are the best practices for systems of systems? In IBM, we have a, a, a community of practice for systems engineers because if you think about it, what we do as software engineers is not just software. We are building systems, and especially as we deal, build devices that are truly intimate computing, we must attend to the physical packaging as well. Again, the reason why we see DevOps come into play. We don't really have all the best practices in place. What are the best practices for systems of systems where I guarantee components are unreliable? We try to build systems and prove their correctness in those systems in which we have great control over them. This is not the real world. I, I respect and appreciate all of you working in the formal methods, but let me tell you that I rarely encounter your work in the kinds of things that I do. I see it in spaces. I see it in places that are very, very important, like in that MRI. But as I look at the vast amount of software being built, it's not making a difference in those places. So my urge to you is do something that it makes a difference because your work is badly needed in these larger scale software systems. Find a way to make yourself profoundly relevant to those communities. And the key of it is you're doing so, proving things in a provably non-reliable environment. How do you do it? And lastly, how do you deal with systems that are programmed by non-programmers? Because a lot of the stuff you're going to be dealing with is both for them as well as being using parts that they develop. Let's go into the theory. Here it gets back to sort of the physics of it. And th this, this next one's a bit of a pet project of mine. There's a, a, a chip that we have at IBM called True North on a project called Synapse in which Demender and his crew have been able to build artificial neurons to the density, about the density of neurons in the human brain. So literally in this size, in about 80 watts, human brain's about 10 to 20 watts, or five watts if you work in Congress, but, <laughs> yes. So, but we can pack into that space about the number of, a number of neurons is in the human brain. Most of the interesting neural networks that have been built are usually in the order of tens of thousands, we haven't really built anything on the order of billions upon billions of neurons, to use a phrase. So the question I've posed is, are there higher order languages that allow us to codify the patterns we see in neural networks and make it easier for others to build uh, large neural networks? That's an interesting challenge. Similarly, what higher order languages do we need for quantum computing? To program a quantum computer these days, basically you set up a Hamiltonian network and turn it on. This is not something the average developer is going to do. So the question then is, how do we treat these quantum devices in a way that I can actually do interesting things with them? Now here it becomes creepier and creepier. 
I alluded to the fact that we're building systems that are on the illusion of, of, of uh, sentience, and I believe that the mind is, is computable. What are the best practices for systems that have to be taught? This is a hard one. So today, you are mostly dealing with systems that from the outside kind of mostly look like input-output mappings. Now we are dealing with systems that are truly non-holonomic. The order in which I teach them changes their behavior. So now all of a sudden, I have the problem first of source ingestion and, and, uh, and data curation. The biggest problem with training any of these systems, software intensive systems, is finding ground truth. And that means I've got to find data out here and architect the data and transform the data in a way that my system can be taught. The next level up is that of how do I build systems that learn? And herein is a new job title that I expect we'll see. This is actually not a new job title. Asimov spoke of it through Dr. Susan Calvin. It's a software psychologist. If I have a system that learns and it did something wrong, how do I diagnose it? What are the tools we need to discover how a system that learned, learned what it learned and did what it did? And so you think debugging is hard now? <laughs> it's going to get worse. So we need, we need your help in this space. Her was a great, great movie. A uh, little bit of background behind this, a, a colleague of mine, uh, Rollo Carpenter, is the inventor of Chatterbot, and he tells me that, that uh, uh, who's the guy who did the movie, Spike Jones? Uh, he sat down in front of Chatterbot for a while and was utterly taken by it, so go, go visit the site. But Chatterbot was the inspiration for what her, her came to be. So the question for me is, to you, is how do we best coexist with a multitude of these personal cognitive assistants. That's very much the direction of the kinds of systems that I see. And continuing, how best do we coexist with software intensive systems that give us the illusion of intelligence? We are at that point, very, very, or very close to that point, that we already see people bonding with devices. My wife has bonded with our Roomba. I, I <laughs> kid you not. She cleans for her. She cleans for her. <laughs> oh, notice it's a she, it's a she. So. Men don't clean. OK. Let's not go there today. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about this later. <laughs> Why is this a software engineering problem? Because we're the ones who are going to build these kinds of systems. Uh, let me go back. I gave you this, this colorful metaphor earlier. Software is the invisible thread, and hardware is the, and, and hardware is the loom upon which we weave the fabric of computing. Let me give you another poetic way of putting it. Software is the invisible writing that whispers the stories of possibility to our hardware. <laughs> we are the story makers. We are the storytellers. And you have a wonderful opportunity to tell some great stories. No matter what future you might imagine, it relies upon software that you have not written, your children have not written, your children's children. But we're here laying the foundation to make that possible. And we've just begun. It is a privilege to be a software developer because we change the world. It is a responsibility to be a software developer because we change the world. And it's a privilege to be here today. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, the only time people have ever stood in one of my talks is when they were leaving. <laughs> I, I'm deeply touched, thank you. And thank you for the organizers to give me the chance to do this. I think we have time for about 15 minutes or less of questions. This is hard to read, but here's my Twitter address, Grady underscore Booch. And please know that every time I get a new Twitter follower, an angel gets its wings. <laughs> so, so yes, yeah, do we have a microphone you can pass around? Thank you all so much for that. Was just, I'm deeply touched. You made my day. Yes. Um, 
this week I have heard a number of talks about emotion detection. Thank you for the emotion creation. <laughs> You're very kind. You're very kind.